Okay, good. Uh, so we, I think we start talking about perturbation theory, and so let's keep uh, talking about it. So last time, what was that? Long time. Ago. We talked about perturbation theory, and we discussed Schrodinger Heisenberg in interaction picture, right? So in Schrodinger picture, states evolve according to the full Hamiltonian, full operators are studied. Uh, Heisenberg picture is the opposite. So in Schrodinger picture, we do have um, Schrodinger equation that governs how state evolves, right, in time. And in Heisenberg picture, on the other hand, we have the Heisenberg equation in motion, which describes how operators uh, evolve in time. And in the interaction picture, we say if Hamiltonian can be decomposed into some two cases, where this part we can solve it exactly. And this part is the trunk, right? Or or any, everything, any interesting information about it. So then we say that operators evolve according to this. So for instance, if we have operator A of T, so that's going to evolve according to that case that we understand everything about. But then we say uh, the state in interaction picture evolves according to some time evolution operator which you define the use of i in such a way that this thing uh, uh, satisfies its own equation. Where this is almost like this H prime, but not quite in the sense that this uh, but is H prime, but rotating by H right? So in this picture, entire dynamics is captured once we know how to solve this thing, right? And so then we, we talk about the fact that how we are going to solve this problem, but we have to be careful because this H i has explicit time dependence, even if H prime doesn't, because, because of this fact. So we can't just type exponentiate this equation, but instead I said that there's this type of formula. Solution is almost like e to the minus i naive exponentiation of the problem of the equation, I'm sorry. But the only thing that we have to care about is put the t, right? Time ordering operation. Did I show last time why he solved the equation, or that's the thing that I have to start today? Anybody, anyone to remember that? Did I show that this? Did I, did I discuss how this is the solution to this equation? No, no. Okay, so let's, let's do it from from, from uh, let's start from there. So time ordering. We already talked about it. So if there is time ordering. Of the two operator, for instance, phi uh, of x, phi of y, well, that doesn't distinguish very much. So, for instance, if I had a two operators, phi 1 and phi 2, with argument x and y, so this basically says that if the time of x comes after time of y, then I have to put the order in this way. On the other hand, if time of y comes after that of x, then I just simply have a flip order. So literally you order according to time. And for instance, if you have like phi of x1 and number of time, you know what to do, right? So you have to just order according to j1 over. Am I gonna make it? Yes. X, J, N in such a way that T of J1 is greater than T of J2 and so on. So literally order according to time, right? So now let's see why this is a solution, at least the formal solution to this key equation. Okay, so uh, there are two key questions here. Can we solve this? The answer is yes, but we have to see. And two, why this is going to be an important picture meaning the interactive, the interactive picture for, for the vision here, right? So we have to understand that part too. 
And after that, we will start talking about scaling policy and FN. So let's proceed. Why do you solve the problem? Solve the equation. So, uh, well, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to take a derivative of this thing with the respect to t. Like this way, so let us do it. So, okay, there's this big symbol. I don't care. That just means that do whatever you want, but at the end of the day, order according to the time. So let me just skip it. If I do the integration this, I get the following minus i times you have done this derivative of this. Then there is this i which is the same. Right? So I've done it. Yes, you might say, oh, how do you know you have to put this operator here or there or somewhere in the middle? It doesn't matter, right? Because it says, write whatever way you want, but this will sort it out everything for you, right? Now, if, so here is a very important thing. So here's, if t is greater than t prime here, which is sensible to ask because this is time which is not greater, so, Naturally, this is a smaller time than this, so it makes sense to assume that. So if that is the case, you see, I'm integrating over t prime, which ranges from t prime to t. I'm integrating over t double prime, which ranges from t prime to t. So t, if this is true, appears to be the largest time in this time, right? So then it makes sense that this actually comes to the left, left most. In fact, I can just take it out of the time ordering even because I know that this is the latest time thing. So I can even take it out like so. And then I just have a time ordering, which is complicated out there, which I will have to worry about eventually. Great. So therefore, if t is greater than t prime, this indeed solves the problem. So that is exactly the situation. If you, if you know how to move I to the left hand side. Okay, so I saw a show. This is the formal solution to the Heisenberg, sorry, to this equation, evolution equation, um, for t greater than t prime. Now you can say, oh, what happens if t is smaller than t prime? Can I still have a solution which takes this similar form? Yes, you do, because I have shown last time that the u, as you, you expect, satisfies the regular usual property for it being a time evolution operator. First of all, this is unitary. First, let me just say, so this, we show that this is equal to uh, inverse of the t and t prime. Well, inverse is often difficult, but because of the unitarity, this is equal to that. So if you know how to get that solution, which you do, you can simply take the permission conjugate to get a U with reverse order. So we can get everything. Okay, good. So that's the nice thing formula. Now, why is this useful? Why this is useful for perturbation theory? Well, now it's obvious if you look at the form of the solution. But now let's assume the following situation. Suppose you are you are given a theory which is described by this total Hamiltonian. Once again, you don't have to solve this problem. And then this, so in this case, I'm assuming something like this is free, and this is incorrection. Okay, so let's take an example. For instance, there's a Lagrangian where I can add some real scalar field, real scalar field, and then you can have not have this psi dagger. Psi something, and possibly this guy, this guy can have a mass, like so, and this guy also I can give a mass to it. Psi, and I can add also interaction, something like um, phi, psi, psi. Okay, so I can think about many million different kind of theory where there is this quadratic part. So this is simply 
free propagation of a real scalar field with the mass m, little m square. This is a complex scalar field that describes the free propagation with the mass capital M square. And then there's non-trivial interaction between the all these three of uh, particles, right? Real to complex. And controlled by this interaction, strength a little y. Okay, so this in this case will be a prime. Okay, so now if we are in the situation where there is a notion in quote, but it's in quote like this is much bigger effect than this. I put in quote, right? The simultaneous is not rare, right? It's hard to say what you mean, but I, I, I mean this, right? So what it means is that uh, most of the time, the physics is basically described by this free propagation. If you do the measurement a million times, okay, one out of the million times, you know, only one in, in part in a million times, you get to see some non trivial conversion from particle by to side radius. Other than that, it's just every, every all, most of the time is free propagation. Okay, so that's the sense I mean this big inequality, the sense of the probability. Okay, then uh, this formula is useful because the entire time evolution, first of all, do you know how to take care of this H naught evolution? Because you can solve it exactly. Two, the rest of the evolution, which is all captured by this formula, now it's very hard to compute this exactly. So first of all, you have to compute million, not even million, infinite different kinds of terms like this by extending this exponential. You have to resub it. You have to get this. It's very, very complicated computation to do. On the other hand, if I know that this effect is perturbatively small, then I can try to compute this evolution operator in expansion in power of HI. Okay, so you get approximate evolution operator, which will give you approximate answer to the dynamics that you are interested in. Okay, so that's the that this formula is useful because the item is completely singled out for the base of part, which is very in a, a total animal contract. Okay, that's the that this is useful. Is that clear? Because this is 100% in terms of H prime and nothing else. My below this, you know, rotation by H naught, which you should be able to know how to do. Okay, so with the sense, let's actually look at this and, and, and think about what do I mean by. Uh, this expression, let us play up a little bit with that expression, and then we're going to move on to the theater trial. And, and you, you will see maybe today that uh, another reason why this is very useful. Uh, uh, yes, so that's starting today. Okay, so now. Having motivated why this may be useful for perturbation theory, immediately let's expand this thing. Okay, so time ordering of one this And keep going. Right? So okay, keep going. And you will eventually understand like what does that even mean? Meaning what does high order come describe when you want to stop and so on and so first. So you will learn all of that. So now let's do so this is the bus operator. So this doesn't have an even operator. This is the unit operator. There's no no uh, time operator. There's only a single time, so there's no time ordering, meaning there's only a single time. You just write that in this. I think it needs to be done. So, so now the second order in perturbation theory, so this is the second order in perturbation theory because you have two factors of that, or equivalently because you have two different times, or equivalently because you see one over two factorial. So this is the second order in this perturbation theory. So now let's ask, let's think about how to think about this time ordering. So now this thing has a time ordering. Let, let me write it as um, you can write whichever way you want, but let me write time ordering of this operator. 
energy domain. So now let's actually try to uh, look into this expression a little bit further, okay? Just to get a sense how, how you might uh, evaluate these expressions. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, a little bit better. So, uh, so now I'm gonna focus the second term. That will be, uh, well, up to minus sign. Well, up to minus sign. Yeah, so let me not keep track of minus sign. So let me just do one half from the uh, prefactor. And then I'm just gonna split the integration range as follows. So first in the, the first part, T2 integration, I'm just I'm gonna do it from integration from T prime to T1. So I'm just splitting integration range a uh, range T prime T for the T2 integration. So this is T2 integration from T prime to the T1 and the T1 to the T. Okay, I'm just splitting the two. So that, uh, so in this case, so this enforces the fact that T2 is necessarily less than T1, right? If I focus on this range. So what it means is that I have to put H1, H1, uh, T1, like that, right? Good. And then I would have a second term. In this case, I have to finish up with T1 to the T. In this case, uh, this first is the fact that now T2 is greater than T1. So I have to follow the instruction of the time ordering operator or time ordering symbol. Uh, so T2, T1. So, so far, I just did it. I just wrote it uh, according to the meaning of the time ordering symbol here. All right, so let's continue further. So what does this, these two range mean? In order to understand that, let's draw uh, this picture, which you might have seen or not. No, T1, T2, and then we say that this, this is T2 is equal to T1. So uh, we are doing integration, for instance, on T prime, the T, T prime, the T. Okay, so now let's understand uh, how does this range correspond to in this picture. So first term integrates in terms of T1 from T prime to the T. So in terms of T1, I have the sum entire range. So for T2, it only starts from the T1. Sorry, it only, it, it, only, it should end at the T1, right? That means that, let's see, so for each T2, I cannot go beyond the T1, right? So when I sum over entire T prime to the T, for T2, I have to stop here. So that's this range. That's the first term. Got it? Okay, good. Now, for the second term, let's look at this. So, um, I'm going to make a change in variable. So the, what, what I'm going to show is that this is the same as that. So let's do it. So you have to do that. First of all, you know, if you compare that with that, I have to write the uh, change. I have to do the change in variable in such a way that at least integrality is the same, right? Otherwise, there's no hope to compare. So in order to make this integrality the same as that thing, I just need to do the same for the variable. Meaning, I just recall T1 to T2, T2 with that, and this needs to be the same. Okay? So now let's do it. So that means that uh, this turns into T2, but that becomes T1, that becomes T2. Okay? I've done it. Now I just need to understand what this means. The integrality is the same, let's understand this. So, uh, for now T2 integration, I, I should do from T, T prime to the T freely. So I have to do entire range. Now it says that when I do the T1 integration along this line, I always have to start from the T2 point, then T2. You see? So for any given T2 value, 
for T1, I, I should start from the T2 on the upward kill T, right? So that's this. You with me? So trivially, so that is the same as that. Right? So this is the same as that. Therefore, keeping this nice and formula, let's go over and We learned the problem. Over two vector wheel of time ordering of dot integration and then you want hopefully you, you, you understand my super simple notation. And this is prime t prime t that's what I mean is the same because there was a one half one half I showed that this is the same as that. So there is a manifest time of range. So for T1, I'm just going to do free integration for full range. But for the second argument, I start, start from the uh, zero uh, minimum value, and then I have to start with the first argument. So there's a manifest time of range. And then therefore, uh, I have to write Okay, so this is simple fact. Now, one can actually show that what about if I, I, I look at the nth order term? So that looks like order of n factorial time ordering t prime to the t, t prime to the t, e1, en, e do, do my if I no. That is going to be the same. Just like in this case, there are the two factors that I have divided by two. I just need to compare. But in this case, you will have n dimensional q and then n divisions. But the final answer is manifest time of meaning the integration with respect to t1, which you do the full range. So the second one, start from the bottom, you have to stop to the previous one. Third one, again, start from the bottom, you have to start the T2, and so on first. So Tn, start from the bottom, you have to start at the previous uh, argument. So there's a manifest time of range. So in this case, you will have T1. Okay. Some facts that could be useful to know. Okay, so, so, so far, uh, not much of the dynamics. This is the, the formalism, right? There's the interaction picture, there's a, a formal solution. I just did this to give a sense of what, what this expression actually means, for instance. Okay? So if you know this, at least you can hope that you, you, you may hope that hope to compute this quality. But, but so far, there's no context yet, right? There's no context. So what should we expect given an interaction quantum field theory? What kind of observable do we want to see? And how do we want to understand such a verbal? Right, that's that the question. So with that, I will end the discussion about the interaction picture. Now we will move on to the gallery and aspects. Yes. Um, when you calculate when you calculate that integral, you yeah. have naturally like, rule out the case when t one equals t two, but it's not always to zero. I mean, it could not be always integral to zero. So yeah. So your your, your question is what it happened exactly at this line? Yes. Good. So uh, that's when you have a two operator, right? One is defined in terms of T1, the other operator defined in terms of T2. And when you ask the question, what happened when T1 is exactly the same as T2? That's when two operator collide. So, so uh, geometrically, you can think of like there is a timeline as a as a geometry of your, your geometry. There's one operator here, another operator here, right? So T1, T2. And they, when they put them together, they collide and, and coincide. Uh, formally, when that happens, often you, you hit, you, you get the singularity, you get some divergence because uh, it, it, it's set on the exact same point. This is a mathematical operation. But physically, everything has the finite resolution. There's no, there is no quite, uh, you know, uh, much of a sense of saying like exactly the same point in time. 
because everything has a part of it uncertainty inside, for instance. But nevertheless, people ask this sort of question, what happens if you stack these things together? And that's a, a machinery, what's, what's known as the operator product expansion. So when you put the operator together, exact same space and, and time point, then you can ask what other operator, like single well-defined operator that captures same effect of stacking this operator together. So when you have an operator product, you expect that the deck can be written as some of other operators, which form a complete basis in the operator basis, who had the same effect of having this feature. OK, anyway, uh, I'm just trying to give you a formal answer. Maybe that's not what you were looking for. So is that, a, a, is that why the anchor on the P1 equals P2 equals always zero? Oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, you're saying? Were you saying if I do integration along this, that's zero? Well, that's measure zero amount. If, if, if that's what you meant. Is that always the... Oh, yeah. In, in this particular case, um, well, there, there are two effects that collide. One, uh, if this is well-defined being at the same time, it can be, right? Generically, it can be. Then the, the contribution from this line makes up the measure zero amount in this two-dimensional line integration, right? But generically, I mean, so for this particular example where this is always this HI operator, so I can't, I can't just say, but I'm saying, uh, if what you can ask the question of, uh, like having this sort of structure in quantum field theory with some other operators, possibly, then you can say whether that contribution is always negligible. Um, not always, because now, yes, this, this is only measure zero of contribution, but sometimes you can hit the singularity when, when they coincide. So generically, you know, you have to think about it when you have this such a situation. But here, um, maybe it's okay because this is the same as that, right? If you coincide at the same time point, right? That is literally the same operator. So, um, Although, yeah, so even, even for the same like, identical operator, if you stack, uh, uh, stack them on top of each other, still you can get a singularity sometimes. So you have to do what is known as a real gate kind of composite operators. But, but, but anyway, for this, this particular example, uh, particular discussion, um, I'm not sure it, it is right to say that it makes a like, legally joyful contribution. I think it doesn't have a significant uh, uh, issues with this formalism. Uh, but in general, I'll say it should be case by case, meaning you have to look at the explicit expression for this and the nature of the interaction and ask what happens if you stand on each other and so on and so forth. So in general, it's really case by case. Uh, but this, at this level of general discussion about the uh, features of the solution, um, I don't think that plays a significant role. But I, I think about it. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to the gathering. Okay, so uh, here is some now content.
So quantum in quantum field theory, um, this is one of the one of the main observables that we want to test. So uh, for instance, um, you can say who are the players, main players in quantum field theory. By now, hopefully you have the answer, your own answer. There are particles, right? And at the end of the day, the reason why we constructed a quantum field is to have a description of the particle in a consistent way, right? Causality, unitary, blah, 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 right? That's what, that, was, that has been the process we've been taking. So one of the main players, one of the main players of the quantum field theory is the particles. And once you have particles, what you can ask is, you can ask scattering processes. So scattering processes goes as, as follows. So asymptotically for our future, I will make it more precise, uh, formally, mentally. Uh, you have a set of uh, particles that that they look like non-interactive. Okay, so for instance, at, at LHC, you have a proton that's circling that way. Another proton that's circling that way looks like they don't interact at all, almost. And then they, they're getting uh, close to each other at some point. They, they collide very locally. And then there is a product of the collision that comes out of that interaction point and then just freely fly away from the interaction point, interaction point. So the picture of a scattering in relativistic uh, quantum field theory is that if this is my time method, so you have a set of collection of almost non interacting looking particles. So each of these line to me is like particles propagating on this line. And then at some point they collide very locally. And there's a product of the collision comes out and they fly away from each other almost really too. Right? So this is a typical picture of a of, of a scattering property. And then the question is, how can you make this statement? I just said more carefully and precisely. Good. So, uh, so there for D say, which I will make precise. So first of all, you have some sort of asymptotically far away. There's a synthetic say. Actually, what I just drew, this picture may not be precise, which I will make, uh, I will clarify. And there's interaction. If, if you like, this is past or Sometimes called it in a synthetic state. There is now a future or out a synthetic state. And you want to know what's the probability for such a thing to happen. So that's the scattering. Now, uh, to do this carefully in the interacting quantum field theory, we have to define it as a role. Of there are this in kind and out kind. So let me define the in state first. So uh, let me say it in words first, and then you, you really want to uh, understand what I'm saying very carefully. This can be a confusing concept. And a lot of times people have a wrong understanding about what, what it means to be uh, in, in, in and out. So let me say in word. So if you have a, a state okay, in quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, uh, that thing has uh, all the dynamical or history, time history in it, right? So for instance, you can take the shredding equation, okay? So if you take a shredding picture and then you take the state, that has a time dependency in it, right? So if you know how that looks like at a particular time, and then if you understand everything about the Hamiltonian, you should be able to tell what it might look like at a later time too. So a say, a quantum say, or physical say in, in quantum physics, quantum theory, is like a movie, already established movie, something that you don't want to change, okay? So, but then you can label that movie according to how it looks like at a particular time, for instance. For instance, they say, oh, I'm super prejudiced about the early time. So I'm gonna say that state, I'm just I'm just gonna label that state according to how they look like as t goes to minus infinity, for instance. But saying that the that state looks like a free particle in far future or far past 
does mean that it is actually a product of non-interacting particle. It just looked like that at a particular time, but as time evolves, it can do crazy stuff, right? And it will look like at all, like collection of reparting later time. This is a way of labeling a physical state according to how that looks like a particular time. I can do the same thing, but get me around, for instance. Now, I want to organize every state according to how they look like in the far future instead. Okay? So given a Hilbert space, given a Hilbert space, I can organize an entire state, again, which has all time dependence and dynamics in it, according to how they look like here versus how they look like here. So I can go up in basis. So I can have take a complete basis of Hilbert space according to how they look like here, let me call it in basis. I can do the same thing in terms of that thing, which I call out basis. Okay? So, uh, good. So then in say is like, first of all, I have a set of in say, right? So the collection of this thing will be a basis of this is my uh, uh, in hem Hilbert space of full interacting interacting Hamiltonian. And let me introduce another notation, which I'll, I'll just use now zero to say that this is a given respect the basis of another zero space. So now this is a given space. Associated with non-interacting free Hamilton. Okay, so now let me establish the definition of insight. So this is uh, a state of interacting quantum field theory that looks like a collection of free particles in, 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 as t goes to minus infinity. So mathematically, that can be stated as so. So therefore, first of all, when I say that. Hopefully you understand that uh, what that means is that the insight evolves according to full time evolution operator. So this is in terms of full H. And when I say this, therefore they evolve according to only free California. So that's what I meant by all these statements, right? So therefore the so the definition of this instinct is that the difference between how it looks like as time goes to minus infinity and how it looks like as time goes to infinity becomes negligible if I take that limit. Okay? So there is this very fantastic action movie, and then there's this romance movie. But somehow the first screenshot of that they happen to be the same. But the content afterward is completely different. Okay? So that's what this thing is. Is that clear? This mathematical statement? Okay. Good. So then I can I can define all state. Same value, basically. So I have a set of State, which I call all states. Again, let me just write this way. This is an element of this, the full Hamilton, the Hilbert space of a full Hamiltonian. And then there is, again, this three in such a way that in the far future, So they look like look like looks like they look like a set of free products. Good. So now we can take a key definition in quantum field theory. And we're gonna spend a lot of time to learn how to compute the object that I'm about to define. Yes. What is zero time? 
is it a uh, time where the integration occurs? Right. So good. So uh, it's arbitrary time, but in the picture that I just literally draw as uh, uh, erased, you can you can take for instance zero being interaction point time. Yeah. You, you can, can just choose to be so. Yeah. Sure. Any other question? All right. So now I'm going to define a scattering amplitude and aspect. So I don't have to write. So. Amplitude and asymmetrics. Now, why is this useful? Why are we making this uh, real looking definition? It's precisely because of the picture that I, I erased, right? So you, you, you want to ask, let me take a quantum physical state of the full interacting field theory. And you want to prepare in such a way that they look like a free particle, let it go. Right? So you start with you start with a state that looks like a free particle in far past. And you want to ask, oh, what is the probability of that thing turns into a state that looks like a free particle in the far future, too? Right? Remember, this, these are a, a basis, it, they are two different bases. Right? This is in basis, this is out basis. But it's useful to phrase the physical question in terms of these two separate bases, right? Just because of the physical picture. This looks simple in the far past. This looks simple in the far future. This will look horrendous in the far future because it will be dragged into the, all the crazy stuff. And this will look horrendous in the far past, right? So the question is, take a state according to one basis, and you want to ask the overlap between these two. Simple equation, it has a lot of this context. Okay? So this has all the life, evolution, and stuff. It's just that they look like simple. And this has all life, but it looks like it's there. You want to ask what is the overlap between these two? Meaning, what is the amplitude, transition amplitude from starting from here and turning into there? Yes. Yeah, this is this is the same thing. Okay, good. So I put the T. Why? Remember, this in state evolves according to the full unitary operator U. Out state, which I didn't write, also will evolve according to the same unitary U. So in fact, this is time independent. Right? You, you, you dagger. dagger. They just can't. So remember, one thing that you want to be careful is, and I'm not asking like at some particular time, I'm, I'm computing this up to this, this day, right? <clears throat> I'm taking a state that has an entire history. I'm just asking overlap between these two states. Good. So this, this, this is a scattering amplitude in terms of in and out state. Now, we are interested in writing, so this 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 is now a uh, definition of S matrix in the following form. I want, uh, we want to be able to write this in terms of some operator of that sort. So this is again free state, which also talk to this state, right? The bar past and the same same um, for for phi zero. And this is a unitary operator called or probably it's more probably called S operator. So why is this useful? Now you have a slightly different interpretation. You prepare a set of free particles, and then there's some operation happening, right? Transformation happens to that, and turn that into outgoing free particles, right? You take incoming free particles, turn that into through this operation into a set of outgoing particles. This set can be different from this in general, right? So that now you formulate things in terms of more active sense of operation. So the question is, who is this guy? That is the question. Now we can answer that question because of these definitions. So let me just derive it now. It's going to be a little bit sloppy, but nevertheless, it's quick and useful. Okay, so let's derive that operator 
Yeah. You will see once again why interaction picture is useful. Okay, so uh, so starting from here, uh, what I can say is the following. So uh, I'm just literally using this definition. This in nobody's from math department here, yes? Okay, so okay, there won't be a company. T goes to minus infinity, you take T to zero. So you all have it. Yeah? So it's not empty. Okay. Or is that none of you all have it? What's wrong? So are we good? Yeah. Is it it? Good. So, so you see, so I can rewrite this as follows. T goes to minus infinity, e to the i, your t, u, t zero, ever. Yes? And if you happen to remember by some magic that this was u, i, t comes zero. Remember, in the interaction picture, the way state evolved is like you just evolve according to sharing a picture, but oops, you have to correct, right? Turn back just amount uh, by this much, which is which is from the uh, pre Hamiltonian or or H naught, right? Good. So uh, if you do the exact same thing, well, nothing changes. R is also defined as T prime goes to plus infinity. That U of I T prime zero. Okay. So let me just write the CRM method. So if I write by zero out, sign zero in. Remember, this doesn't matter where I compute it. Okay. Then there is a limit. T goes to minus infinity. T prime goes to plus infinity. By zero, you, oh, okay. Nobody said that. You dagger, right? Because you that oh, you, yeah, you dagger. Okay, so remember this is you dagger. So if I do the uh, permission conjugate, there's you, you find zero, you dagger, be zero, be. Okay, so that is u of i t prime zero, u of i is zero t by permutacity, sorry, unitarity of the operator. And this is what? u of i t prime t. Okay, so you first evolve from t to zero, and then you again further uh, evolve from t to a zero to t prime. Therefore, it is the evolution from t to the t prime. Good. So now, because of this, it's done, right? So now you know what S operator needs to be in terms of one known example or one known object. Therefore, we learn that S operator, which controls all the scattering processes as formulated here, is nothing but that object with the two time arguments. One goes to plus infinity, the other goes to minus infinity. So that is, let me just write in this slot notation. You see, in this picture, I never asked for interaction picture stuff. Right? I just formulated the physics question. question. That would be useful. Let me write this slightly better notation, not notation, but the expression. So this was by type formula, time ordering of uh, exponential of minus i. Now, time to go from minus infinity to plus infinity, dg. Yes, okay. Um, but let me write another version, which is basically saying by defining that Hamiltonian, I'm just defining as 
D3S Hamiltonian density of S. So this can be written as primary of the exponential minus uh, full for integration of Hamiltonian density. So it's not only that uh, the dynamics of the quantum physics can be understood in the rest of the picture by computing this Dyson formula. But it also that all actually one of the most important key observables in quantum interaction vulnerability, which is asking scaling processes at each amplitude, can be extracted once you know how to compute again that's the formula with this relation. And you can do it perturbatively. Right? Good. So now there's good reason that we, we want to know how to compute this object. So let's learn how to compute this object. Questions? Yes. So can we interpret some particle state in other particle spaces? I mean, uh, as interaction happens, the as something collides, then we will find other particles, other uh, species of particles. Mm -hmm. So pi t out will be different state mm -hmm. from psi t. And we are interpreting, so pi t is interpreting some state yeah. from the out state, yeah, and I think that is something strange. Good. So, so if I understood it correctly, the question the question is, in, in in three quantum field theory sense, looks like we carefully define field operator for this particle, another field operator for another particle, and so on and so forth. But once this interaction happens and all non-trivial scaling process can happen, look like like five operator looks like it can excite like set of other particles and vice versa. So it looks like oh, okay. It looks like we can uh, we can describe a set of this particles in terms of other particles field operators. Is that is that a correct statement? Or if so, that sounds weird. Is that your question? The answer is yes. So um, the answer is so that's actually an important question. Suppose suppose you are given some operator O, which may be which may be a a free particle operator. Or say this can be a product of some field operators too. Say this is some operator. I don't care exactly how it looks like and how, how it looks like. And then suppose you check that this has a non-zero of black between you know vacuum and a set of you know particle state with the momentum. That means that this can create such set of particles. Right? So therefore, in, the, in, the, in, this, in, this, in that case, um, this can be written as a product of a free, free field of operators with some property coefficient. And that coefficient is exactly controlled by this, this cell of lab. So therefore, your question is exactly one particular example of such. So in quantum field theory, or quantum physics in general, whenever two states has non-zero overlap, you know that this thing has a portion of that thing. In quantum field theory, we describe that as if that operator has overlap with an operator that creates this state. So O now can be a product of a free field, for instance. So is it related to dressed particle? Uh, it is related to dress, dress the part two, but that then also controls the exact size of this overlap. But but I'm saying in general, uh, here is one example, for instance. So in quantum problem dynamics, which some of you may have heard of and know it, some of you may not know it. Uh, in, in one description of that theory at very high energy are in terms of quarks and gluons. So there's a quark field and gluon field. And then they become super strongly interacting at some point. But then in far infrared, you never get to see quarks and gluons at all. All you get to see is, for instance, high ions, K ions, and eta majors. They are particles. So you may, you may have to introduce Yes, another set of a field operators to describe that. You can do that, but you will learn that those field operators you introduce to describe infrared physics is actually related to the field operator you introduced in the UV physics. So in other words, core, uh, sorry, pi on, uh, pi on operator will be a function of quarks and gluon operator, for instance. So that's one example, actual physical realization of what you just asked. Yeah. <laughs>
Yes. Lots of, lots of people have some misunderstandings about the in and out. Yeah. Okay, so could you give some examples of that misunderstanding? Yeah, so good. So typical uh, misconception of asymptotic state is is that um, uh, so it, it, it is often phrased and if you take the state and you do the time evolution backward and then if it, it actually is the product of free free particle state. Sorry, let me let me be careful because this is going to go into the rabbit hole very quickly. What, uh, what people uh, miss it out is they think that they actually have a, a set of three particle state at a given time. They feel like they think that here is a set of three particle as a genuine sense. Okay. And then they forgot the fact that when you say there's a physical state, it actually includes entire time dependence in it. It is a full video, a full movie. But they forgot that when, when they say that it's just only snapshot is what they mean by a state. So whenever we say physical state, we don't mean a snapshot. We mean a full video, full movie. So this, this exactly this is what often causes the confusion. You may say, oh, okay, now I'm not confused because you have, you're have you given the correct version to begin with, right? So physical state is always full movie. It's just that like you, you just label according to how it looks like that. But I'm saying, well, since you're asked how other people are confused about, they just think that that snapshot is the state. Okay? Then this is totally different. Because then you have to face the magic all of a sudden. Okay, that bridge state is the state, but all of a sudden it turns into something else. No, that is the state new about all other kinds of shape too. It's just a question of how to extract that information. That is the scattering amplitude that we can find. Because it knows everything. And the other one knows everything, just a black Let's see what that looks like. Okay, any other question? Okay, so let's now jump in and learn how to do this. Topic. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna learn about big theorem and big diagram and big extension. Oh. So, um, so this is what we want to compute. So typical object we want to compute. So typical. Object that we want to compute is like something like you know have, we want to do something that looks like this. So so slightly more uh, explicitly, that means suppose I have you know set of particles with a momentum k one to the k n as an out state, and then there is an s operator. So this includes, for instance, time ordering of schematically a lot of integration, and then you know. Uh, a lot of operators, E1 and P, I use little m, L, and then you have another state and n number of instate. Oh, that's bad. So, this is sort of typical object you want to compute, right? So, this, so, if you expand this thing, you will have something like this, right? Good. So, uh, so the question is how to compute this sort of correlation function. So given a state, another state, there's a time ordering of a set of string of operators, right? So the question is how, how, how to compute that thing. So, uh, so therefore, with zero state the following thing. So here, this is a time ordering. So with, with zero,
think about this. So suppose let me use notation that I'm just gonna call it by one, so simplify the notations. Okay. And then uh this is notation so far, and then I'm just gonna we already talked about normal notation. Normal rate, if I write it as, for instance, um, like phi of x, one, two, y. So what was normal rate? Uh, annihilation to the right, creation to the left. Right, remember, annihilation hitting the vacuum is zero. Creation hitting the vacuum is to the, to the left is zero. Remember that? So I'm saying, this is zero and complex conjugate or conjugate conjugate of that answer. So it's useful to write the stuff in this way. So first, this can be written as follows. Let me keep writing it. Um, remember, filter operator can be decomposed as false part minus part. I'm then sure you completely forgot all that. So let me just write that again. Okay, but so free field, I of x. There is this instead of minus IP dot x, that's why it's called the minus part of P. And then there is this plus IP dot x, the plus, and then P. Right? So I'm saying only this part I call plus O. Uh, no. <laughs> Very good. So let's maximally confuse ourselves here. <laughs> uh, so I think I, I told you, if you're actually looking carefully, <laughs> minus IP dot X corresponds to positive frequency propagation. In the, in the five, 500 years ago, we talked about that, if you're forgot. So it, it is this, if you like, you just, you know, always uh, remember in opposite way, there is no dagger. Like daggers looking stuff. So. There's a dagger just to confuse yourself, right? Then there's, there's a dagger looking so. stuff. Then anyway, so we write that, and then that is, we said that. And then, and then just to remind you yet another one really quickly. So we, we look at in the discussion of causality and stuff, so, you look at this uh, questions. Okay. No. Okay. So we looked at object that looks like this. I mean, you can compute it exactly just, just by plugging this in. And then we define, so that if you do it, that computation render expression that looks like that. And then you call that x minus y. Okay. So this is the quick reminder that we, why we talked about. So given a free scalar field of name, and then we just look at this. In the context of you know causal initial condition and causality and so on. Okay, so now with that, let's go back here. So if there is a set of operators, in this case, I'm just looking at the two-point function. Okay, sorry, two two operators. So normal ordering, let's actually look at it. The normal ordering, so I can write it as um one oh yeah and then plus so annihilation part minus so creation part two annihilation creation dot dot okay so so far I just wrote it down the definition of it so let's continue here equal to um, phi one plus phi let's expand plus phi one plus phi two minus phi one minus phi two plus phi one minus phi two minus right it's a little little a little too late to expand it so let's check which one is normal order. So this is normal order, <laughs> right? This is A A. Okay. So I put everything to the to the right. There's no such a thing as all four. And then this is A A that are push that's bad. And this is 
A dagger A. Good. This is A dagger A. Good. So all these three are normal ordered. So normal ordering means that what? I have to uh, write. So everything you keep it as it is. The only thing you have to split is instead you have to write that way, right? As you just rewrite. That's what it means to be uh, normal ordered. Good? Remember that. Now, let's go back. So, uh, with theorem, I have to say the theorem, uh, is, a, is a making a relation, relationship between time ordered expression and norm ordered expression. Okay? So, that's the with theorem, what with theorem says. So, let's actually work it out the, exact, uh, the case for the two point, two point uh, uh, operator first. So, with theorem is relating something that looks like that thing to something no more. And then it plus something more. So that, that is the content of it. But in order to understand the exact content of it, let's actually look at the case of simplicity case first. So first of all, time ordered of the uh, by one single operator. So that is equal to by one because there's a single operator, right? But then that thing is what? Like phi one of minus, minus plus, so it's an annihilation, phi one plus. So I'm just literally writing this. This is also normal order. So that is the same as normal order, right? There's only single annihilation. So there's only single creation, normal order by, by definition. Okay? So we just learned that in the case of single operator, time ordering is the same as normal ordering. Be good. All right. So let's do this uh, the two two thing. So phi one by two. Oops. So uh so ready? Yeah. Okay. I hope to be ready. Let me raise a little bit. Okay, so I need a space. Let's see if I can do it here. So theta is zero by zero by, um, well, instead of one, two, let me say x, y, x, y, and then y zero, x zero, y, x. So that I just did it, which is time over. Yeah? Done? Good. Okay, so now yes. Oh my god. So uh okay. So is one two back? No. Let's do it. So XY. So that is <laughs> we have already worked on this one particular example, right? So let me let me clearly write down an example of that. We just learned that phi of x, phi of why uh, normal ordering? Well, what am I doing? Is this <laughs> right? So that's this. So okay, now what I'm what I'm trying to do here, you see, I'm just gonna rewrite this in terms of normal ordering plus whatever that is present, right? That's what I'm trying to do here. Good. So so therefore, uh, let's first work it out one one of this, which is. That time, actually, let's make a slightly more space. I'm pressed. That times. Um, here, there is no normal ordering. So I'm, I'm comparing this expression without normal ordering. That's exactly just that. And the one with the normal ordering, which I have to believe this is. Remember? Good. Good. So uh, I'm doing it. This is the crunch time. Normal array. In other words, I have to do this. But then I have to write that, but I have to come back to this. So I have to subtract this at that. Yes? So that means um, I have to have five uh, x plus 
pi of minus y of minus. Okay. One more time. No normal order, meaning I just have that here. That is equal to normal ordering plus that minus that. Right? So that is from here. Good? All right. So then, now the second thing I do is do it. Okay. Good. So then we learned that time ordering of phi of x, phi of y is equal to. Now remember, this is the same as that. I don't care what's in there. There is this dictatorship. You have to write our final expression according to what this is trying to say, right? It's the same thing. So that is the same as that. Therefore, there's two expressions with the theta of that thing plus theta of that thing, which is one. Right, that, that thing is like half of that is one, this is zero. The other thing is saying this is the one, this is zero. It's just adding up that which is the one. So therefore that is saying normal ordering of phi of x, phi of y. And then to that the, the expression of the last So x zero minus y zero. The other way around. So, time is no ring plus this thing. So, what is that plus this thing? So, we talked about this, right? This is the delta plus x minus y. That is delta minus x. And this entire thing. This entire thing, which is nothing but the difference between the time and normal ring, we're going to write it as phi of x, phi of y, and called contraction. It's a notation. But let's understand the meaning of it. Okay? So obviously, time over ring something is equal to normal ring plus contraction, its name. So what, what does that basically mean though? What is what is the meaning of this contraction? What meaning exactly this object? Okay. So uh, the answer is contraction is first of all, this is a C number, this is an operator, this is an operator, this is a C number. Okay? So there is this operator which is equal to another operator, I mean no no operator plus. Correction, which is basically the same number, not an operator. So this is an operator, and this is a number. Basically, this is nothing but um, since this is a C number, this is the same as looking at expectation value, vacuum expectation value, right? The C number just passed it up, it's not an operator. And this is a little vacuum in the back, but that's one. But then, uh, one thing that you can also see here is that normal ordering, so here, vacuum expectation value of any operator, normal order operator is given, right? That was the point, why it is useful to have a normal order operator. Because annihilation always to the rightmost, creation always to the leftmost, right? So the vacuum expectation value of normal order operator is always zero. Therefore, this is equal to, Time order of phi of x, phi of y. So I'm just writing. So first of all, what does this mean? If I had a time order operator, and if I look at the vacuum expectation value, in this case, 2.5, that is the base A thing, it is contraction. Okay, there's no order that doesn't contribute. Now B, in order to understand the physical meaning of that contraction, which hopefully you have done the homework problem. 
if not the, uh, here is adverse the whole problem at least. So if you compute this this thing, or if you just compute this explicitly, either way is fine. So I'm just continuing here. So that is actually equal to And if you want to follow, let me take a pause and then and then uh, summarize what what just happened, and then I'm gonna state the general view. Okay, so what just happened is following. Time ordering of the two field operator is the same as normal ordering of that operator plus the rest. The rest, I called it a contraction. Contraction is nothing but this particular formal object, but that turns out to be the same as basically computing this two-point function as a vacuum expectation value. And that is nothing but computing propagator from point y to the x in space and time sense, that in momentum space of y, forget the y, sorry, just like that, that is this, okay, formally. So uh, to sum up, contraction of two operator is the same as what's known as final propagator, but propagator from one point to the other. If you like, why is the propagator? This is the propagator. I'm just giving a name to that uh, uh, complicated looking object. Okay, so 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 that's the first thing that we learn. Now, uh, which theorem? Say the following thing. Okay, so uh, let me say there are this string of n operators with different times, right? That, that's what I'm talking about time order. This is equal to completely long over the this. Okay, and then the rest. The difference between the distance time and normal ring is a Okay, so I, I will write down this version for four point function uh, right right now. So then we'll hopefully clarify what, what, what this uh, long looking statement. So let's first write down the four point function version and then come back to this and try to understand the meaning of the zero statement. So suppose if I had phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, time order range, but that is the same as first of all, all normal order. Four. Okay, annihilation to the right, place to the left. And then I have to write down all the one contraction. So what are all, all possible one contractions? First of all, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, three, two, four. One, two, three, four. One, four, two, three. 
everything I've done, all the contractions, one contractions, and then there's only uh, two, I guess, out of the two contractions, one, two, three, four. One, three, this, three, four, one, four, two, three. What is the difference between the second? Oh, shoot. No, no, no. What, what are we doing here? I'm supposed to get rid of all of that. No. Sorry. I screwed up. So I, I want to write down only the one contraction here, right? So one, two, one, three, one, four. Oh, shoot. There's way more. Da, da, da. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah? Very good. So one, two, one, three. Actually, six, right? One, four. Two, three, two, four, and three, four. So, so total six, one contractions, and then three, um, two contractions. Good. So therefore, now going back to this statement, meaning is the meaning of that statement is if you have the time order ordering of the string of operator, normal ordering plus all one contraction with a one coefficient to one. Sum of all two contractions with all the coefficients to one and all the way down to the maximum contractions. So if it is an even number of strings, you will have a complete contractions. If it is odd number of operators, you will have everything but single missing out contractions. And then the key point is that the coefficient is all one. And I have a proven to you that in the case of a two point, two point case, right? Two operator case. Now, uh, uh, how we prove it? By induction, as you would expect. So we assume, so base point is worked out, two point worked out, or two more, two more point worked out. You assume n minus one point satisfies this criteria, and then you add one more, show that it also works out, right? So let's do it quickly next time. And then after that, we will uh, develop a diagrammatic, uh, diagram, diagrammatic machinery to uh, compute the dice for Okay, uh, that's all for today. I'll see you on Wednesday. Wow. <laughs> Thank you.